So um, what I wondered was, because there are a few people here like me who were not at the lecture, whether we could challenge Dr. Williams to spend two minutes, a sort of <laughs> television length of time, um, just distilling his lecture, the absolute kernel of his case. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> One of the other things I'm not is economical, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly, we make a great mistake in thinking about divine power if we think it's a vastly exaggerated form of human power. Human power deals with limits, constraints, and managing those. We imagine sometimes God's power must be like that, only much greater, so that God always gets his way. We need to rethink our concepts of power because in traditional theological terms, the power of God as unlimited is inseparable from his will, his creativity, and therefore we need to think of divine power as the very being of God coming into the world in certain circumstances and certain conditions making a difference. What do we do about it? We don't try and harness it to our own use. We try to get out of the way and be silent, humble, and realistic enough to try to allow God to be God where we are and make a difference as God wants, the difference made, not as we do. I'm worried as a journalist, as a reporter, that my whole life is taken up with faith conflict. Human conflicts are very varied, and in spite of some efforts to track them all down to faith, it doesn't quite happen like that. Um, faith is a marker of identity, just you know, as a sociological observation. When people's identities are under threat, they may very often turn to faith as one vastly important and apparently very resourceful and powerful identity marker, which can be brandished against others. If religious faith were always the source of conflict, you might expect to see conflicts in places where, in fact, you don't. That there are faith-related conflicts in so many places does suggest it remains a very strong identity marker and a very dangerous one. But if the religious difference is only the, um, the armour you put on rather than the root of the matter, then you can have friendly bishops and imams talking until the cows come home and not get to the, the root of the question, which might need another kind of address, which is more perhaps social and economic. One of the biggest surprises for me as Archbishop of Canterbury was the amount of time I found myself spending with Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> um, simply because dialogue at at least three different levels with Muslim scholars and leaders was built into, I won't say the, the weekly round, but certainly the monthly round. Three levels. Um, most locally, the Muslim Christian Forum in this country, which was set up about 10 years ago to try and encourage grassroots dialogue between communities over issues like um, education, welfare, health care in communities. Um, there were interfaith uh, ventures with families and young people, that sort of thing. That continues. Um, at another level, I convened every year a group called Building Bridges, which brought together um, usually about 30 to 40 people, half Christian, half Muslim, from around the world. And it was indeed a very interesting exercise working out who the significant or strategic people were to invite to that. We didn't make great play of this. We never issued agreed statements or policies. We just took a subject, for example, faith and science, or um, religion and modernity, or law, and spent a week engaging on these subjects with our texts at hand. And then there was the whole process that was around the, um, the Common Word Declaration, which came from the Muslim leadership addressed to Christians. And um, I was involved in one of the first responses to that and several of the follow-up events. So um, there, was a, there was really quite a lot of that and a lot of willingness to pursue it. And a certain amount of political capital from some areas invested in it as well in, in the Muslim world. I'd also say in terms of 
some forms of religious extremism. But the reason I talk in what you call idealistic terms about pure faith or whatever is that I believe, at the end of the day, bad religion is driven out by good rather than by no religion. And that the, the energy to combat toxic extremism is more likely to come from within a religious tradition than outside. Give me an example. I think that, I, let's stick with the Muslim world for a moment. Um, the kind of discussion that is beginning to develop in some um, Muslim uh, jurist circles about the death penalty, about the apostasy legislation, about women's rights, that is far more effective in changing um, attitudes in Muslim communities than a, a simple direct assault from uh, secular modernism. What about faith in politics? I mean... Yeah. That <laughs> you, you have some, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot. Uh, um, but let, let's, let's, let's travel into the United States and look at the Tea Party. With many of whose followers. <laughs> if we followers must, we are, must. Well, if we must, <laughs> we must, yes. but they're a very serious force, yes. and, and mm. many of them are very devout believers, mm. and, um, and yet their impact on politics, some would argue, is not always one which produces a happy outcome. Mm. Some would argue, and I would agree with some. <laughs> hmm, indeed. Um, without going into the, the detailed question of just how effective the religious right now is in the States as opposed to 20 years ago, and I think there is, there is a shift that I see, um, I mean, a shift in the direction away from excessive influence, Quite a lot of that relates to something I touched on in um, the lecture earlier, or in the questions afterwards, that there are forms of religious traditionalism or conservatism, which, while claiming to represent you know, the mainstream of their traditions, are in fact radical departures. Um, Wahhabism is, of course, a, a modern reform movement within Islam. American fundamentalism is a 19th century creation. Um, and therefore, they are, in some ways, paradoxically, the, the children of modernism itself. They're, they're modern reactions. Were the Founding Fathers then either inspired or misguided to try to establish a constitution that divided church from state? Hmm. <laughs> Perhaps they were just sensible um, <laughs> or pragmatic. But there no, but no, it's a big no, question. It's a big question, it? yes. Um, what are they after? There, there shall be, what's the phrase? There shall be no establishment of religion. Mm. Hmm. Meaning, as I understand it, that there will be no legal privilege given to any Christian confessional body. I think it went further than that. I, I don't think they wanted any formalized faith of any description anywhere within the political structure? I'm not convinced of that. Um, they're, you know, they're 18th century rationalist Christians who believe that rational Christianity is the foundation of ethics. That, you know, that's what Jefferson thought. And of course, he produced his edition of the New Testament to prove it, which is a very interesting volume. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but you could have all that without any formal. But uh, depends what you mean by the word formal. There shall be no establishment of religion means, as I say, there shall be no legal privilege for any confessional body. I don't think that necessarily means there shall be no, um, no voice for religious institutions within the debates of the state. Where is faith in war? But justifying rather than blessing, I think that's pretty much what somebody like Archbishop Temple would have said in the mm. Second World War. Um, and I, I'm not a pacifist. I, I wish I could be sometimes, because it feels a bit simpler than trying to take each conflict on its merits. But I have that lingering unease that pacifism may be trying to have it a little bit too simply in a very, very complex world, where sometimes it seems as if the use of force is the only way in which we can restrain the... If you'd had to, would you have volunteered in the Second World War? Um, yes, I probably would, actually. Yeah. Um, 
Because in addressing us about these issues, mm -hmm. you're talking about very real, yes. living, yes. absolute forces. And we need your help. And the help, what, yes, what's the nature of the help a public religious figure can give? Not, in my experience, offering solutions, but saying these are the questions without which we become corrupt and sub-moral. I look back on the early days of the Iraq War, not quite sure whether my judgment was right or not. I said very critical things before the war began. Um, I remember publishing something when hostilities started, saying, well, you know, now the decision's been taken, what's the next moral question? And it has to be, how do we get out and what do we do and when we have? You know, what constitutes a successful engagement and what's the long-term strategy? I still think that was a good question, actually, and I didn't hear an answer <laughs> Certainly then. Certainly hasn't been now. answered yet. No. <laughs> I, I felt a certain embarrassment in pursuing you know, the whole question of the, the morality of the war once hostilities had begun, I suppose because of a sense that other people were living with their lives at risk and putting other people's lives at risk in a hideously difficult, complex setting where I was sitting comfortably in Lambeth Palace, and I didn't feel very easy um, grandstanding, if you like, on the ethics of the war once hostilities were ongoing, and thought it was my job to try and raise the longer-term questions, and as far as possible, um, help to provide a bit of pastoral support for a lot of chaplains in the field, which was one of the things that was actually part of my job description as Archbishop. I'm Bishop of the Armed Forces. <laughs> How would you characterize the state of faith in Britain today? Institutionally, not very strong. Emotionally, still quite a bit stronger than some people think. 